Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, the channel. It's been a while. We've had a few people wanting to come on and then it takes ages to set up a, a day and time. We're a little late. Artie couldn't make it today due to, to some personal issues. And I've got the lovely Lilith basically jumping in at the last minute thank you lilith for saving the show so today we we have joe ensley Artie was actually the guy who sent me a video of joe and it's probably the video that got has got joe in trouble the most which is how to witness to atheists and i and then i saw that he had talked to a few friends already as uh, he i saw he talked to godless engineer he's been on jail warren's bridged uh, the divide channel jail's a good friend of mine i did watch the show with jl because i i always watch when he's got people on and i for some reason i had missed this one but yeah we've got joe here today finally a theist who says i want to come on and then we get it done within a couple of days, set up a show. First of all, that's great. So, Joe, do a quick introduction for people who do not know you yet. Sure. Yeah, my name is Joe Ensley. I run the uh, Gospel Religion channel. And obviously the video you're referring to, How to Witness to an Atheist, was written by a Christian for Christians hoping to reach atheists with the gospel. And then turns out atheists did not like that video at all and took it very personally as if it was aimed towards them, which it wasn't. But then that ended up in me getting invited on lots of atheist podcasts and shows and stuff. And I'm happy to discuss my beliefs and some common arguments. I don't even really consider myself an apologist. But yeah, happy to be here, happy to have the discussions. And I think in our culture right now, one of the biggest issues is that people can't talk to each other uh, without getting really crazy about it and canceling each other. And so I think whether or not anybody's beliefs change or whatever, anything like that, just having a discussion is important. So I'm happy to be here. So what would we do on our show is basically, I, I want to set some kind of an example that even though we might not have the exact same beliefs, it doesn't mean that we have to be enemies. And so this is sure. one of the things that I'm trying to do here is having good conversations so that maybe we can find some common ground and we don't have to be enemies in real life. So that's that's basically the the idea. People are saying, by the way, that, that your volume is a little bit low, Joe. I, I don't know if you can crank it up a little. Uh, I can. There we go. See? How that, is this working out? I think that's cool. I, if we get more complaints. Okay. Yeah, our first question. So you're, we already know you're a Christian, but can you explain a little bit more what your beliefs are, what, what type of Christian? And the more pressing question is, why do you believe what you believe? That's At least that's the, the one that we like to focus on. Sure. I would be in the Orthodox uh, camp of probably conservative Christianity, which means I would hold the Bible to be true and therefore I, I would follow it. And more importantly, especially when I'm having this discussion with uh, non-theists or people who aren't Christian, and especially when I'm talking to the crowd of people that are pretty offended that I would say the things that I did, like in my video, How to Witness to an Atheist, I would say that the important thing to remember is that I think Christians should be consistent. So if you're going to say that you believe in the Bible, then you're going to have to believe in a literal hell and you're going to have to believe what it says. So God's pretty clear that only his children are going to heaven and then the lost, those that have rebelled against him are going to be perishing in eternal fire. So if I think if we start there, it's a really good introduction to understand why I would say things like I say, because if I actually do believe that my friends who do not believe in God are going to spend their eternity in suffering, uh, the only possible option for me, if I actually believe that, is try to help them off of that, to say, hey, don't do that. That's a bad thing. Can I warn you about where I believe you're going? And then can I show you a different option that uh, exists for your eternity? So why I believe what I believe? I think for me, Christianity became real for me when I realized that my way didn't work. My way of living life wasn't great. And of course, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit has to act on your heart so that you can have your blinders removed and you can actually see uh, yourself and your sin for who you are and who God is. And I would say 
why I believe what I believe, why I believe in a God that seems so unbelievable to people who don't believe in him is because I've experienced a God that is bigger than anything else I've experienced. This is something that has happened to me. I've seen changes in my life. I've seen changes in my mind because of what the Lord has done, things that I can only contribute to God. So oh, that, that would be my answer. Your faith is based, if I'm reading you correctly, and do feel free to correct me if I get it wrong, your faith is based in a sense of how you have interpreted your own personal experiences in dealing with your faith. But presumably, the Bible, believing the Bible, and believing a specific interpretation of the Bible, because there are many interpretations and understandings that have various arguments for them, that had to come from somewhere. You didn't just get up at five and read the Bible and then have a specific theology already made. Sure. I was exposed to Christianity growing up, not at all the kind of Christianity that I would follow now, but it was a version of Christianity in the Bible. And so I was aware of biblical ideals and principles but I think really when it came very real for me was when I didn't really want anything to do with the kind of Christianity that I grew up with. Uh, wasn't really great. Uh -huh. And I don't hold those beliefs uh, that I would have held growing up. And I wanted a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at life. And my problem, my inescapable problem was I could, I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I cannot look at a universe that screams design and not randomness and say, oh, it's random. It just got here by chance. I just couldn't bring myself to do that. And so I had to reconcile with myself, what am I going to do with the fact that everything seems very designed? I need to know more about the designer and that all religions have the same issue they have to deal with. What are we going to do with this Jesus character that is every historian, secular or unsecular, the serious ones, they say he was here. He said some things. He did some things. What are we going to do with this guy that was very different than everyone else? And then turns out we base our calendars on this guy's life. What are we going to do with this guy? And so the type of Christianity I've arrived at, I believe best deals with that Christ figure accurately according to the Bible that he affirmed. Can I jump in yeah. real real quick, Lilith? Because there, there are a couple of things that I really want to react to. The, the guy we base our calendar on is probably a pope, an early pope, a guy called Gregory, because that's why it's the Gregorian calendar. I don't think I don't think that's the guy that you had in mind, but our calendar is not based on the guy that you had in mind, because then we would at least be a couple of years off early or late. But one thing that I do want to know, and I've heard a few people say that I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Why do you think you would need faith to be an atheist? What part of atheism needs faith, you think? Yeah, you have to believe some pretty crazy things to be an atheist. Uh, like number one, you're either, okay, so first of all, you're going to have to, dealing with just the teleological argument for God would be a good starter. If I find a, a watch in a field, I don't think that a watch came out of the field. I think that someone dropped their watch. The simple mm -hmm. logic that uh, when I see something that has been designed, I look for its designer. I see that. And so when you look at a universe that is, you could go down the fine tuning range and look at all the different planets and which ones can have life and which ones can't. And to see all the things that have to line up perfectly for there to be life on our planet, for us to function, for us to even be here. And especially if you try to go the earth is millions of years old route to look at all the possible ways of extinction for humans, for us to even be here. Uh, it takes a lot of faith to think that was a randomized chance event when the logic would point us to a designer. So that'd be one of the first. So you, question that logic. Uh, one, 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 um, one, one thing, Lilith, you're not looking at any evidence. You think that going by faith is a better route to determine well, what I, is and what isn't real? No, I, I think when you go the fear blind faith route, like the atheists do, I, I just don't think that's tenable for anybody that, and can, so I would believe. Can you lot, name me one atheist? Can you name me one atheist? was ever told you that they take anything on faith. Because I don't know if you're aware, Lilith is a co-host on, on Arn's channel, and I think Lilith is basically what I am as well. I'm an epistivist. I reject faith 
or it being the most dis dishonest position to take because there's nothing you could believe based on faith. So you could believe in mutual exclusive propositions. You could be a Muslim based on faith. Based yeah. on faith, but it makes it no more probable that it is true. However, it does have the added benefit of making it next to impossible to disprove something so that if you are wrong, you will stay wrong. But mm -hmm. you have no great probability of being true. exactly now. I find it um, faith in all utterly life? in every sense. Yes, completely. Wow. Okay. So, how do you to have that level of never having faith in anything means you have to question everything and be skeptical about everything. Which Precisely. Means, yes. Which means very quickly you're going to be faced with the blunt force of mortal limitations of being unable to be skeptical of everything. At some point, you're going to have to trust something. You're going to have faith that what is real, what you no. what you think is real. I'd like to, Peter, I'd like to jump in here. Yeah, go ahead. This, I, Peter was never a believer. I was. I was a devout believer. And however many times people have told me that I was never a true believer, and many Christians have tried that line, none of them ever knew me as a believer because no person who knew me as a believer can possibly be that hypocritical. I took it as seriously as anyone has ever taken anything. Now, when it comes to belief, trust, faith, all these things, I think we need to be clear about what we mean by faith. And if we're going to go to a dictionary, we're going to look at belief based on conviction. People and in practical terms, if you and I are talking about something and you say, we just have to have faith, that's always the end of the questions. And that's the part that I, I'm out. No, I but will that, not that, believe something. However, I think it's important to point out that as, was it Hume who said to proportion belief to the evidence? It is possible to hold a belief or an understanding with a degree of certainty that's less than absolute. In my experience, children and con men are the ones who are most intensely pushing for 100% certainty. Children because it makes them feel secure and con men because they want to fleece you. But as an adult, I have to recognize limitations and I will under take my best understanding of a thing. However, if new evidence comes in, I will revise my understanding accordingly. And yes, I'll trust experts to a degree, but based again on their effects. I'm gonna guess you have a smartphone. Sure. I'm yeah. also going to guess, and please don't take this as an insult because nobody knows, that you don't really understand quantum mechanics because I don't really understand quantum mechanics and only physicists who study it understand quantum mechanics and even they don't understand it intuitively. It's really freaking weird. Sure. However, quantum mechanics is the reason I have more power to Google and watch YouTube videos and play silly games with angry birds than was used to send man to the moon. So I can see the practical legitimate effect of something and thus I accept it on the basis of recognized effect and the fact that if they were wrong about it, or if they were lying about it, rather, they would have had to have come up with a more convoluted explanation than whatever the actual explanation was. And that's just too much work for no reward. So it's not against conspiracies, but they got to have some motivation. And so we that's the type of thing I'm talking about with proportioning belief to the evidence. Okay. Now... And and Lilith, just, just, about... Lilith, just real quick, we, we also have a question from the chat from Professor Flynn oh, for Joe. And okay. he says, he says, does Joe understand? Wait a minute. Why is my tool not working? Okay. Does Joe understand that faith and trust are not the same thing? He's being yes, very Joe sloppy. Okay. Many of the arguments that atheists took offense to in your videos and have taken go. offense to in other apologist videos, and it, you certainly haven't, it's not like you reinvented the wheel here, have had to do mainly with the fact that they are attributing positions to us we do not hold. 
And we get very annoyed when people lie to us about ourselves or lie to others about us. And then those people come to us with a whole schemata of how they're going to have this conversation with us based on all these things we don't actually think or believe. And they're, then we have to either try and rework their entire understanding of the dialogue and start from scratch again, or tell them to stop being so presumptuous and leave. And depending on how much time I have that day, <laughs> there may only be one option. I think, first of all, let me clarify a couple of things. And I want to talk about things I say that might misrepresent you or be seen as a lie for your worldview. First of all, you describe yourself as a true believer. And that's describing someone who quit a marathon as a marathon runner. We don't have to have any reason. If someone starts off a marathon really hard and they run really hard and they get really sweaty and then they quit the marathon, that they still didn't end the marathon. And a biblical believer is one who's going to persevere throughout their whole life. So I, I can't defend people who have made that claim before. I don't know how they made that or if they were mean about it. So if that's the case, uh, that's not cool. But I would say that a biblical believer is one who's going to persevere in that belief throughout their whole lifespan which might be a possible reason people say you're not a true believer. Although you did believe at one point, you believe that sincerely and you don't now, that would put you in a different category biblically. Does that make sense? No, I do understand what you are saying. And that's certainly less presumptuous than many of the people have come before who stated that I never truly believed. I would have to take umbrage with that based on certain biblical texts and what they talk about with people leaving the faith. and But then we'd have to get into uh, more specifics about your belief and the issue of Calvinism v. not Calvinism, which I do hope we get to at some point. But I let you continue with what you're saying, and we can revisit it at that point. Right. To revisit that, we'd have to use the Bible, which you don't believe in. So that would be pretty unhelpful, I think. <laughs> Doesn't mean I don't have one. Um, <laughs> Sure. And then also, I'm taking a different position. You said that uh, a lot of times the theists are going to bring back their questions to you have to have faith. And you're not going to hear me say that very much. In fact, you're going to hear me say that very rarely. I take the different argument, which it is, I believe it is, it, it, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it takes to be a Christian. That would be the position I would hold. And we can get into that more in a minute. But I want to say one thing. Uh, people that say that maybe I misrepresent the atheistic worldview. And again, I, I, I wish people could take just a moment and consider if I actually believe what I believe, if I actually believe the Bible, then I can only be consistent in that by saying what the Bible says. And the Bible's pretty clear in Romans 1 that anyone that doesn't believe there's a God, uh, that God says they have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and that they actually know there's a God. So when I say things like atheists really do believe in God, I'm just restating what the Bible said. So if that is something that would upset someone, they're still not mad at me yet. They're still mad at God because God is the one that said that, not me. I believe what God said about that. Oh. I'm not making up the idea that atheists think this. I'm just Paul is the one so, who said that. But here's a question, Joe. If you then talk to an atheist and an atheist tells you that is not what they believe, how how can you then say, okay, but it's in this book. Clearly the book is wrong. Because you, you come across right, people who, I, who will tell you who will tell you different. And and I don't okay, think that there that is, there is, I don't think let me finish real quick. You don't think that everyone is just lying to you. I've never been religious. I the whole concept of God was never introduced to me. I did go in a church for the first time when I was 16, which was for a funeral for the wife of a friend of the family. And this was in a Catholic church. There was no mention of God, probably because the husband was an atheist. The children were also not believers. The wife, the mother was the believer. And this is why they held a, a service in a Catholic church. And then my religion has never been a topic in my entire life. So I could not believe, even if I wanted to, I could not believe in a God that was never introduced to me. And even though I know the Bible says this, but there are more things in the Bible that are, are demonstrably wrong. So if you keep talking to people like us and we will tell you, listen, it's not actually what we believe. Yeah, we could lie to you, but we would there would be no gain in lying to you. There, there, for me, at least, I, I don't see a gain in lying to people. 
I'm too stupid to lie because then you have to make notes. And so I lied. I, I lied about <laughs> this to that person. I lied about that to that person. And then every single time I go visit those people, I have to go over my notes and check with all of my lies. So I make sure that I don't screw up when I, when I talk to them. Too much so, work. I, too yeah, much work. it's much easier to be honest because then you, people can't uh, uh, trap you and 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 find out that you said something that wasn't that wasn't true. It's it's much easier. It's much much more comfortable talking to people if you don't lie. Here's my problem, and I'm just going to be uh, honest with you guys. Saying that people are lying when they say that is the charitable answer. There is another option for people that truly believe there is no God. But that answer, it makes people even more upset than the original answer. The most charitable way I can handle that is the Romans one way, which is saying they're suppressing the truth in their unrighteousness. But there is another alternative biblically, and that is the Psalm 14, one option, which says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I hate to just go up to someone and assume they're a complete fool. They have looked at a designed creation and rejected a designer. I don't want to start off there. So I like to start off at tier one, which is a lot more charitable, which is, hey, they probably actually believe this. They've just been hurt somehow, or there's something going on. They want their sin. They don't want to be responsible about it. I like to start there before I go to the whole, maybe they're just a fool at heart. I hate to go straight to that. Does I that have to admit, it's interesting what you find charitable. Christopher Hitchens was famous in this debate, as and he and even Richard Dawkins would famously say things that would be quite offensive in the name to their opponents in the name of being charitable. I remember the one poor Mormon fellow who Dawkins horrified by saying, I will do you the credit of assuming you do not literally believe whatever Mormon fan fiction thing with Jesus and God boinking Mary in the back pasture. And he was horrified that this would be the charitable answer. Foolishness, uh, in this case, I think it's Aaron has frequently made the argument, and I agree, that in every other area of life, the fool is too readily, is someone who too readily believes claims, preposterous claims with insufficient evidence. As far as, so most of us would actually consider it more charitable to assume you were stupid than to assume you were a liar, hmm. because to be a liar speaks against your character. And while I find that distinction interesting. I found it interesting as a believer too, because when I tried to understand what it was atheists thought, uh, not ever thinking to join them, just simply trying to understand what was this other perspective that was so different from my own, I was struck over and over and over and over again, very forcefully, by how stringently they advocated truth. And that was the thing that was most important. I'm sure you've seen debates in certain cases that are not going perhaps in the believer's direction and they'll start to talk about the social utility of faith or some other such thing that has nothing to do with whether or not the claims are true. And I found that quite an interesting observation to make that the opponent's side at that time for me was so deeply concerned with that which was factually correct. Hmm. I think there's a couple of things there. Number one is I might have learned something. I, I would think being considered foolish would be worse than being a liar. I don't know. But you know what? Maybe I learned something today and I will start off with the foolish as my charitable and then move to the lie later. Maybe that would be a better position for me to take in conversation. And I can take a hint so we can work on that. But well, this... This appeal to truth, this appeal to truth is interesting. And I think that's an appeal to a truth they have defined out of desperation. When you see atheists arguing for truth, that's something that they actually are, they're going to have to borrow any truth from a Christian worldview. They can't <laughs> produce any <laughs> level of truth outside of borrowing from that. That is a claim I've heard many times, and I wonder how often you've considered the assumptions needed to justify such a belief. Okay. Because the truth is that which is evidently true, statements which are factual and in evidence. Evidence is a piece of verifiable information that can be verified repeatedly by any person at any time. I am holding a glass. 
This statement is true. This is truth. Not perhaps quite so grand and esoteric a truth, but nonetheless, I do not require the existence of God for this statement to be true, I, that I'm I, holding a glass. I would be curious, I would be curious, Joe, what is your definition of truth? Truth is the personhood of God. God is truth. For Christians, truth is not a thing. It is a person. God is what is true. So what is God is true. What so is God? What hold on, Lilith. Hold on. I'm holding a lighter. Mm -hmm. Is that true? We're going to assume it's true for now. I mean, the, I'm, I'm, could, look, are you looking take, at the screen? Okay. This could be trick photography. This could be CGI. <laughs> I'm willing to I'm willing to work with you. Yes, it is most likely true that you're holding this lighter. If we're going to get into ontology and how we know what we know, my, that's a My question my qu Okay, hold on. My my question is what did God do in this scenario? What did God uh, do in that scenario? Yeah, I'm 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 holding a lighter. As you can see, I'm I'm yeah. clearly holding a Zippo. Okay. What part what, what did what what part what part of what part of this action is god well god created the materials used to make your lighter and you so no he, did, he, did. he had a lot to do. I, I i i can assure you i can assure you that god doesn't melt metal anywhere in a factory and so the material he didn't make the lighter he made the materials that produced your lighter what makes you and think so you. what makes you think so uh, the first first verse in the first chapter of the book that I believe in okay. says in the beginning of the okay. heavens and the earth. That's I, I, I get that. But what makes you think that is the case? Like I said, we, I've got to go with the most faithless option for me. I've mm -hmm. got to go with the one that's going to make the most sense. And first of all, we have to figure out our basis for how we know what is true and what is right and anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the only possible way you're going to come to any understanding of that and not be completely arbitrary is if you uh, go back to the God of the Bible. Okay. So, so I take it you've you had some education. I take it you've had some education. So according yeah. to, according to what, how did the elements form? Let's flip this around a little bit. So Lilith. I'd really be curious how you think the elements formed because for the most part, for the most part, we know how the elements formed. It's something that we can observe that is still happening. We know this, how this works. So my, my, if you say God made them, then how? But even to know those things that you say you're knowing, you're going to have to borrow from the Christian worldview. You're still what, going what to have part to borrow. Of, what, part, what, what part of the Christian worldview are we borrowing if we do our science and notice that in particular stars, different elements are formed through, through fusion and the, the other processes? What if we're yes. borrowing, if we're borrowing from Christianity, we have one book. Where in that book can we find something about the forming of the different elements? In what well, verse well, is the, that? The, the difficult part about trying to explain to people where they borrow from the Christian worldview, the thing that makes that most difficult is it, it'd be like trying to explain to a fish that it's wet. Uh, we're so saturated in it, we don't know that it's all around us. So to even have order in a universe that supposedly came about uh, by random chance and evolution, to even no, believe it, in it, order, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't. So, sorry, I have to jump in. I have to correct you. It didn't come okay. by random chance. Awesome. Okay. So what what is the non-random chance cause of the universe? Physics. I actually have to clarify something there, too. The ideas that the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist camp attribute to us and attribute to science are really bad parodies, really mm -hmm. bad parodies. Think of the worst, most cartoonish atheist parody of a Christian belief you've ever heard of. It's that level. It's, it's, it's the equivalent. It's the, I, it's the equivalent of us telling you that you have an imaginary sky daddy that that would be insulting it wouldn't be true because that's not how how you see him he's not, he's also not in the sky according to the bible so it would be wrong on on many levels and i know that atheists like to use it if they want to be cheeky if 
the conversation isn't going well, those would be remarks that you would make. Let me finish the answer here so we can get somewhere there. Go, go so, ahead. Uh, you mentioned that we, we can observe these things happening. We can do scientific tests. We can look at things happening. And to do uh -huh. that, you have to assume that things like logic are true. You have to assume that mm -hmm. there is an order in our universe. None of those things can arise from an atheistic worldview. You cannot prove uh, logic in your science lab. You can't test it, but yet you're going to have to borrow from it. What do you logic. think logic is? An immaterial truth. Yeah, okay, okay. it's an immaterial truth. But immaterial so truth. When, when I, I take it that when you talk about logic, you mean the three most known laws of logic? Okay, those are man-made concepts. It's a kind of language to, to explain what we see. And the fact that we can trust them is because they provide continuous results. Every time we apply those, we get the good results. So we know that this is, we know that this is working. And so the people who came up with the laws of logic are uh, yeah. philosopher, philosophers in, in science but they're not the oh, only totally. they're not the only three laws of logic there are multiple forms of logic i'd so, say the point is and, and, that the laws and, of logic were discovered by testing mm -hmm. and logical fallacies also but to assume that testing will result in the same results each time, that a test is reliable as it is, requires a universe of order and design. Yeah, but guess, we don't yeah. assume requires... that. We don't assume that. The, the those requires... are things that we can find out Peter, by repeating. If I drop my pen, will it fall to the ground? Of course. Yes. You're assuming it. You're no. assuming we live no, in that's based on, that's, No, that's based on that's No, it's based on evidence. We can test no, that. But, sorry, we can is, test that. There is I mean, no evidence we, like that. In we can we can't test that. There, I did it. I can Correct. do it again. You I can live, do it again. You live in a universe that and is ordered. That is governed no. By we live in a universe. Theory. We live in a universe that's governed by uh, by physics. The pen Peter. dropping is physics. And so, as I, I would think, ask you the same question. I'd like to ask a clarifying question. Okay, go ahead. There is the only assumption that we are making that cannot be justified without itself is that of inference. That is a well-known problem that we infer from something, something else, which allows us to predict things in the future. No form of human thought is possible without inference. No systems, nothing. So yes, that is in a sense an unjustified assumption. The assumption you have not justified is that this comes from intentional design. Materialism, natural materialism, philosophically speaking, the, the kind that science is based on for practical purposes, is that the universe consists of matter, its interactions, and its matter, its interactions, and its properties. I almost said particles. That's it. That's the not supernatural view of the universe, that matter exists, that it behaves consistently with its properties and interacts according to those properties. And obviously in various circumstances, there can be various interactions, but that we can understand them because they are consistent. The idea that a God is required for matter to exist coherently and systematically is something that theologians want to assume but have no way of justifying beyond a few poetic phrases in scripture, which quite frankly is not evidence on its own. I can understand how you would feel that it was, that the God creating and sustaining the universe versus like that. But when we're talking about evidence, we're looking at things we can all verify. But see, this is, like you, you, this is like you finding the watch in the field, pulling it apart, learning how it works, and then telling me all about how this watch works while I sit over here saying, someone dropped the watch. And you say, we know the watch is made up of these things, and we know that this is how it works. And I say, no. but someone made the no. watch. Yeah, and why, so you, and why, why, you and why, why in the field? And what, yes, and you why, how, how did you know? Work. Hold on, hold on. How did you know that someone made the watch? Well, you tell me. No, I'm asking well, you. You know what a watch is. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Lilith. Come out of fields? 
by themselves? I'm asking you, how do you know that a watch is made? It's not a trick how question. It's not, it's not a trick question, but it's going to get me somewhere. Because Bear with. designed objects are designers. No, it's no, because you it. know that watches are made. We can go visit watch factories. We can go visit watch makers. We know they are made. We know how they are made. You can pretty much test all of that. As opposed to the rock it is laying on, can you go to a rock factory? Wow, you're going to say that nature is less complicated than a watch? It's not no, a no, compl complicated isn't a measure of design. Simplicity is is um, a measure of design. I don't, I don't know about that. You have, man. Like, yes, because everything you own is in its simplest version to get the desired result. Okay. A pen doesn't have extra parts that are useless. It's just the parts it needs to work. It's simplicity. The more simple a design, the better the design is. And, and I'm still confused because we, we veered off from the truth thing. And you said truth is God. So how do you, differ, God. How do you differentiate between something that isn't true and something that is true? And God's revealed his word, and that gives us to a litmus test so we can understand truth as it's revealed in the Bible. And so the Bible tells us what is true and what is not true. Okay. Hold on. I've got an example. You have two bottles. You can drink from both. One of them is poison. How does God get you to figuring out which of the two you can drink? God never promises to reveal that information to me. So God isn't truth god hides the truth man that that seems a little convoluted you, god didn't make a promise no, to do look, that and god didn't, you didn't said ask me to put my you said situation. god but you said god doesn't reveal it god knows the answer right if i have two bottles one is poison and one isn't does god know which one is poison yes but he doesn't tell you all right, if I have to figure out which one of the bottles has poison in it, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to use the scientific process, which is going oh, to Oh, you're going to borrow from the atheist. Bottles. You're going to bor borrow from the atheist worldview in order to figure out what true is. No, hopefully I'm going to finish my sentence. I'm going to have to use the scientific processes, which come from laws of logic and order, knowing that my universe is designed by an intelligent being, knowing that I can expect that if there are certain qualities in one bottle, that will make them poison. If there are certain qualities in another bottle or not there, that will make it not poison. Knowing that I can see an ordered mm -hmm. design universe that works according to the laws of physics, because it was designed, I know that I can, with the right tools and equipment, determine which bottle of water is poison or not, because I don't think that there's a random chance issue on whether it's poison or not because okay. i don't operate in a consistent atheist world okay but me being cheeky is in this entire explanation you made an assumption that we don't know we can't test everything else you said is based on materialism on science on anything where a god is not necessary you just slipped in one more layer saying the universe is designed, which it clearly isn't because of our ob observation. It, it clearly materialism isn't designed. Only work. Materialism only works and naturalism and these processes only work if you first admit the existence of immaterial truths. And when you start having to determine where the immaterial truths come from and how we can decide what immaterial are true or not. Okay, what immaterial truth and how do we figure out if it's true? All right, like I said, let's go back to the laws of logic. Laws of logic tell me how the scientific process works. The whole scientific man -made process is built on it's, it's a, and it's a, it's a man-made concept. That's a man-made that's a man-made concept. The laws of logic are the laws of logic are nowhere hold on. The laws of logic are nowhere in the Bible, but there are tons of things that conflict with the laws of logic in the Bible. Name one thing. In the, in the Bible, it says that no one has seen God, and in another verse says they clearly have seen the face of God. God shows up at Abraham with two other guys. The other guys leave. God stays and has dinner with him. 
Yet no one has seen the face of God. If someone would see the face of God, they would die. Those are mutual exclusive concepts. Those can both be true. You, you, you can't say no one has seen God when there are clearly people in the Bible who have seen God. Yeah, that's like uh, people saying that they know me and me saying that they don't know me. And they've met me and they've shaken my hand, but they don't actually know me. There's various levels of seeing and knowing somebody, and that's what God's but, across. That doesn't but I a- have, hold on, but we're not talking about knowing, we're talking about seeing. So I can see you, and you have seen me. I, I you see you, but I don't, I'm not actually there. But that doesn't make it a logical contradiction. And on one level, I see you. On a whole nother level, because we're not in the same room, I don't actually see you. So okay, it's but, not a logical contradiction. But your face wouldn't look okay. different in real life than it does on camera, right? Yeah, maybe not. But it's not a logical contradiction for me to say that I've seen you both and that I haven't seen you at the same time. If I have a question for Joe. Go ahead. Specifically, you've made several claims about naturalism and what is required of it. Who told you? that naturalism required randomness and chance and all the rest of that. Oh, I think naturalism assumes a Christian worldview that there is a design and an order to our universe. I think if you'll look at an atheistic teaching in any science book, they're going to tell you about evolution and how we've adapted based on environmental changes. And it's a pretty randomized process where we just change according to pressures, but we don't actually... Yeah, but we don't actually live that out. That's not a random process. Changing in response to pressure, opening a fan that runs into my hand because my hand is here, that's not random. That's cause and effect. There's a physical, you bump against a thing, you bump against it. The thing that I feel Peter might be objecting to is you saying that this is somehow Christian and necessitates a Christian worldview to believe that physical reality contains consistencies. I'm saying that your idea of naturalism being random and chance and totally, not even subjective, but entirely arbitrary is the part that I think you have been misinformed on. So are you here by random chance or are you here for a purpose? Neither. See, we have to get really arbitrary, I'm, really I'm, fast. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm, I'm guilty of Lilith being here. I found Lilith on Twitter <laughs> a Dude, long time a long time ago. We're here for a purpose, and someone created that purpose, which means you just proved my point. No, no. we've actually we've proven the fact that purpose doesn't come from God. I've made we've it. I've made it part of my life. Past each other. Part of my life is making purpose to have this channel to have conversations like this, because I think that conversations like this serve a purpose, not just for me, but for more people, for people who are watching both on the theist and the atheist side. So this is a purpose that I created. I created the channel. I created the artwork. I found Lilith. I uh, became friends on social media with Lilith. I think Lilith is awesome. So obviously, I wanted Lilith to be part of my team, and she has been for quite a while now. And I'm still pushing Lilith in directions where I think she needs to be. She's a co-host on ours channel where they read the Bible because Lilith is great when it comes to the Bible. She knows most of it by heart. I, it, if we were to do a quiz... I'm sure I haven't memorized more than 30 percent. Yeah, if we were to do a quiz and we and would pick it, random Christians... The universe around you has Sorry? nobody designing all these purposes. You just told uh, me about every actually, detail. Actually, no. no he said this. he designed those every purposes. Every detail of this podcast has been designed by him and created with a purpose. And mm-hmm. he's going to look out his window and see all these people fulfilling purposes and not think that someone put that together. That no. is the arbitrary no. hypocrisy of atheism. Mm, no. so, so what you're then, saying, yeah. hold on, this is interesting. What, what you're saying is that God thinks that it was would be a good thing for me to start up this channel, and over the course of the years, I've had several emails from Christians who have walked away from the faith. So if God planned all of this, then 
God doesn't have a really good purpose, right? Because according to the Bible, he wants everyone to know him and everyone to love him. I, I, I know that I've heard you say that's different because apparently God creates creatures to just burn it in hell for eternity just because he likes that. It is weird that God would set me up to do this to lead people away from him. Wouldn't that be silly? Well, first of all, I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys don't pretend to be theologians because that was a pretty scary misrepresentation of biblical teaching. What I'm pointing out uh, is the hypocrisy. I'm a, I'm, Joe, I'm, I'm a little bit cheeky. I, I saw you. I know that you said I'm not easily offended. You seem to be a, a pretty cordial guy. I, it, someone that I would love to, to go out and drink a beer with or whatever and, and talk about all kinds of different things. So I'm allowing myself a little bit of cheek just to keep the conversation light. If that's a problem, just say so, and then that's, oh. that'll be the end of it because I'm not here to, to insult offended. you. I'm not offended. I would swap out the beer for a scotch, and then we'd add cigars to that, and we'd have a great day. Oh, I've got, and that'd be fun. Mm. I've got four and a half my- liters right here, so... 40, 40, I, just 40 years old. we don't understand God's purposes does not mean that he doesn't have those purposes. Now, I think there's a logical fallacy built into, oh, wait, but I don't see how God's purpose could be fulfilled through this channel. That doesn't mean that God's purpose doesn't exist. It just means we don't understand it. But, and I'm saying there's an inherent hypocrisy in showing me how you have designed this whole podcast with a purpose, and then you would look out at an ordered universe and think that has no purpose and was not designed. That is is pretty hip- hypocritical to and well, a very inconsistent oh, label to apply. No, because if when I look out to the universe, I don't see a designed universe. I see something that would look pretty much the way it does, according to the explanations that we have so far on how it got here. We don't have everything yet, but we do have a pretty good clue. And we get more and more evidence in over time. We're not done learning. We, we, we still learn every day. No, we still... Yes. For a long time, they thought that the Big Bang was the start of the universe. Turns out that people are slowly walking away from that because the universe appears to be eternal. If you talk to it's, Sean Carroll... Well, as, it's as, not eternal in its... Not in this state. Not in this state. But I'm, the I'm universe... Gonna, I'm gonna yeah. When, so I'm when I speak about the universe, I have to explain, when I speak about the universe, I speak about everything that exists. That includes our known universe there might be more so the cosmos yes but that the more accurate term the I'm cosmos is a word that. that isn't used anymore at least not by theoretical Peter, physicists joe gave us his 10 minute warning he okay. does have somewhere to be i have one thing i want to clarify go ahead with regard to joe because it, the, the thing with the purposes and intent and design i do understand that argument And I understand that it has an intuitive appeal, okay? And I'm not saying it doesn't, okay? What I'm saying is, I wonder if you should perhaps, for the sake of understanding, not necessarily to adopt them, look at some other concepts of how things come to be. Because in nature, we see things very frequently that are self-designed. And I'll give the simplest example I can think of, which is a snowflake. Snowflakes develop in a very pretty geometric pattern, yet with infinite variation because it's not an absolute pattern and it because of the polarity and the shape of the water molecule, dihydrogen monoxide, that they then, if they cool in such a way, crystallize. Yet you have beautiful ordered structure. It doesn't mean that there are little fairies chiseling them out in the clouds. They form that way of themselves. The ancient Chinese would refer to nature as that which exists of itself. That is a concept which I was not introduced to for many years. And it's a concept which I think you should consider trying to understand a little better. Again, not necessitating that you must accept it, but in order to not misrepresent people who do not hold the same opinion you do, it might be better to think, look into a little more of that because 
energy dispersing throughout matter will create order with elements of randomness. Not wholly random, just as a game of Monopoly is not wholly random. You roll the dice, that's random, but the, you don't just throw the whole box in the air and see where everything falls and then decide whoever boardwalk landed closest to is who wins. It's, again, intention, the assumption of intention here is I think where you two are talking past each other because it seems mm -hmm. very obvious and intuitive to you. And it seems not at all necessary to Peter. Yeah, you're right. And understanding how someone can look at a thing and not see it as necessary and without in any way diminishing the beauty, the complexity, the splendor, the infinite variety, and the intriguing nature of the forces that emerge from the conflict of matter, or even the poetry that is inspired by that. I think there's more to that, and I think you might find it interesting, again, not to adopt, but to understand that perspective a little more clearly. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you being generous and trying to offer me an, an alternative to having this conversation. Did, did I see you knitting earlier? Yes, a crochet, but yes. I'd like you to consider the fact that those pieces of yarn, no matter how much we understand how that yarn was made and how those loops go together, I'd like you to consider the viewpoint that someone has to use the crochet hook to knit that thing you're making for it to happen. And just because you understand how it gets there, the forces that are involved and the elements that are involved, doesn't mean you can cut out the person and expect that whatever you're crocheting to take shape. And with the watch analogy as a uh, similarity, I'd like to point out that nobody has to make the hair grow on the sheep. The sheep do it themselves quite without conscious attention. I don't believe they sit around thinking, oh, grow. They might. I've never read the mind of a sheep, but I'm going to guess no. So if things in nature occur, it's the primacy of intent is something, again, I think humans find very intuitively appealing as an idea. I, I, that's how we think of ourselves. And we see the world not as it is, but as we are. That's our first instinct. And I do understand where that comes from. But people have considered other perspectives based on the evidence and have often found them to produce better results than the assumption of intent. In order to preserve our time and ask any questions that hit in the chat, we will save the argument about whether or not we should abandon human intuition for a later time. We'll, uh, we'll take well, that. Not, not, not wantonly, but just let's say we should test our intuitions. Okay. We can agree on that. We should test our intuitions. We might disagree Excellent. on how we get there, but Peter, we found a common ground. So you can be proud of us. Yay! For that. Go team. <laughs> Oh, Peter, you're muted. Sorry. I like uh, it. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> most people like me best muted. But yeah, so you you were referring You've to... You've been a great host, Peter. I, it's been very friendly, so no, you're fine, dude. No, you, you were referring to the whiskey, right? When you said we found common ground? I, yeah. Yeah, scotch or whiskey. I'm, I'm good with either one. So I, only have a, I only have a tiny it. bottle, 40 years old. The labels have fallen off over time. And I'm still saving that. I, I was going to open it when I turned 60 and I didn't. So I need a new special uh, occasion for me okay, to open. Okay, I'm going to be in Europe come Christmas. <laughs> if I'm anywhere near you. Yeah. I, I can be in Europe around Christmas if you're opening the bottle. <laughs> I can be there. See? I'll pick up JR. We'll make a day of it. <laughs> I, I, I love the conversation so far, and I'm, I'm sorry you only had an hour because I could talk for at least several more hours to you. I've got so much more questions. So if you want to come back on another occasion, we'll be more than happy to host you. As goes for all of our guests, we, we also like to offer you a show where you decide on the topic and ask us questions. I have seen... Quiz I have, me on the Bible. Yeah. Who would I dare? <laughs> 
I have seen that you have been talking to a few other people and that you're not convinced that evolution is a real thing. I could set uh, you up with an evolutionary biologist and have you have a talk with him. He co-hosts on our channel every once in a while, but if he wants to do it on his channel or both, I'm, I'm open for that as well. I think that would be a really fun conversation to have. But as I said, I still have a ton of questions that I would love to ask you. So if you're up for coming back for round two, more than happy to have you. And you've been a really good guest and a good sport because I did throw a few cheeky things out there, which I usually do to keep yeah. things light. People, a lot of people get really easily offended these days. And I, I find that tiresome everywhere you look. People are offended and Sometimes it's for good reason, but a lot of the times, I, especially on social media, people getting offended Sometimes over absolutely nothing. There. Yeah. Some people like being offended, Peter. Remember yes. that. Some oh, yes. Some people absolutely love to feel wronged and owe oh, the pathos. Mm -hmm. Alas for me. Oh, drama. Yes. There are always those people. Who, there are also people who take quite legitimate and, offense to things that are actually dangerous to them, and that's fair. And I will say those are on both <laughs> sides of the spectrum as well, because I've come across those when it comes to Christians or, or theists in general. I've also seen a few atheists where I thought, hey, you, you can really take it down a notch because it's not that bad. I mean... I'd rather enjoy scotch than offense, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Okay, is there anything, Joe, because we're almost at the time that you have to leave, is there anything that you still have that you wanted to get out and share with people that we didn't no, get to? No, I, uh, I'm grateful to be on your show. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, this, was, this was a really good time. I hope you understand that I have these conversations. I make time for these conversations because I do believe what I believe. And my goal is to see sinners come to Christ and to understand God. And I understand why people do not believe uh, in the God, I, I, or at least I'm coming to more and more of an understanding of that by talking to atheists, the reasons why they don't believe. And I still believe that there is a God bigger than most atheists have ever experienced out there that they need to meet now before they meet later. So I'm here uh, to spread that. So if anybody has any more questions about that, please look at my channel on Gospelogian. But if not, I can't convince anybody. That's not my job. I just want to have the conversation. So thank you for being really good hosts and keeping the profanity down and not being super diggy. And I'm all down with a little bit of cheeky humor. That's just fine. So thank you guys for having me on. The profanity doesn't help. For some people, it's they love to do it. It's part of their language. I know, Liv, for some people. I, I For me, it doesn't help. I, I don't use a lot of profanity in daily life, so why would I use it on here? It depends on the usage. I maintain George Carlin made a very good argument for intelligently profanity can be used. But I'm also aware that's not always how it's used. Yeah, and I'm, I still think that if there are people who are bothered by profanity, then I'm more than happy to just not use it at all. It's, if you want people to respect you when they come on your channel, then you should also respect the people who come on. And as I said, there, there are a few things where I jumped in where I thought, this is borderline offensive, and I'm... I can't tell. I don't know you, so I don't know if you're saying things on purpose or because that is your honest uh, belief at this time. If it is what we can do, we can correct you. If you then still keep doing it, then obviously it is some, something's off. But I didn't get that idea. You can usually tell whether or not people are sincere in their beliefs because they're not hypocritical. And I've watched I'm, enough of I'm your conversations that. To think that you're not a hypocrite, but I appreciate we, the credit in my direction. Yeah, I do have a hard stop, guys. I've okay. got to roll out of here, but thank you for the conversation and having me on. Yeah, I want to thank everyone in chat. Sorry that we didn't get to all the questions because of the time constraint, but who, who knows? We'll see if Joe wants to come back 